Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Alexandra Taylor, an associate editor for CNEN, and I will be moderating today's event. This webinar is titled Drugging the Undruggable Using Advanced Fragment-Based Drug Discovery and is being sponsored by Wuxi AppTech. CNEN works with sponsors to identify topics of interest and value to CNEN's audience and consistent with CNEN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the help widget at the bottom of the screen or type your query into the Q&A box. If you're disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You're encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, and as your moderator, I will be posing as many as time permits. Please note that CNN does not endorse any company, products, or services that may be mentioned in the webinars, and that each webinar will be archived at CNN online after the live webcast. The presentation today is being sponsored, sponsored by Wuxi Aptech, a leading global pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical, and medical device open access capability and technology platform company. Wuxi provides a broad and integrated portfolio of services to help its worldwide customers and partners shorten the discovery and development time and lower the cost of drug and medical device R&D through cost-effective and efficient solutions. During the presentation, we will hear from Nushka Shamer, a subject matter expert at Crelux, a Wuxi Aptech company. Prior to joining Crelux, Nushka was head of research and development for biochemistry at Nanotemper Technologies, where her contributions led to the development of a new generation of dyes for the microscale thermophoresis. I'll now hand over to Nushka. Before I present fragment-based drug discovery, hits for challenging targets, I would like to briefly introduce you to Aptech. The Wuxi Aptech subunit belonging to our search service division, RSD. Wuxi Aptech's hits integrated with abilities in RSD provides client with a one-stop solution to lead and lead to candidate. We have four units two in China, one in US and one in Europe. The one in Europe is located in Munich and the site's core expertise is structure-based drug discovery and fragment-based drug discovery. Let me briefly introduce you to the concept behind Wuxi Aptech Hits. This target to hit platform has four major parts, proteins, screening, biophysics, and structural biology. Protein production is one of the key components of target to hit platform. As Francis Arnold, Arnold said, you get what you screen for. Thus, we want to provide a high quality protein reagent for any types of screening or biophysical studies performed at Wuxi Aptex hits. Why is target quality so important? If you start screening or any biophysical assays with not properly folded protein, with aggregated protein, then of course you will select against these anomalies. But if you start with the target quality, which is let's say over 90% pure, not aggregated, correctly folded, binds to your positive control and forms expected protein complexes, then you can be quite sure that practically your screening campaign will be successful and you will obtain a significant amount of hits. This slide illustrates the importance of protein quality. At Crelux Protein, you can see pure protein monodispersed which binds positive control and is also properly folded as shown in thermal unfolding profile of this protein. The pro provider's protein, that means it was simply a protein was purchased for some catalog provider, was shown to be not pure, not monodispersed, did not bind positive control, and it was also not properly folded. That means for you, if you start the screening campaign with this type of protein, you will, of course, obtain some hits. But these hits will address this suboptimal protein fold 
aggregates of this fold and practically not targeting the real function of the protein. On the other hand, I would also like to remind you on the power of protein engineering. With protein engineering, you, are not, you don't get only the possibility to put the right tag or a specific tag on the protein or just clone and express a single domain, but with protein engineering, you can do much more. So you can perform mutations which will lock your protein in active or inactive conformation. You can mimic phosphorylation or dephosphorylation status. You can block certain binding pockets with intention to disclose or make allosteric binding pocket accessible, which you would like to target. So the protein production opens much more potential, much more opportunities than simple protein quality. With the pure and functional protein, expressing appropriate tag, expressing appropriate domains, now we can go on and continue into the screening campaign. The core of screening platform at Wuxi Aptek Kits are Fragment and DNA encoded libraries. These are two approaches which cannot be more different in its essence, still they follow very similar workflow. Let's start with fragment screening. So for fragment screening, we start with the fragment libraries, which contain only a few thousand of fragments, so let's say one to three thousand. In these fragments, we can go and call fragment screen, which can be either SPR, surface plasma resonance based, or microscale thermophoresis, X-ray crystallography, or NMR. As you see here, we need very powerful, very sensitive biophysical assays. At the end, we have a bucket list of hits, and with this bucket list, we go to hit confirmation, where we confirm the hits using various biophysical and biochemical orthogonal assays. DNA encoded library screening, on the other hand, contains a very large amount of compounds in the libraries. Currently, we have over 80 billion compounds. These compounds, they go first to affinity screening, and with the lists or so-called enrichment from this screening, we follow up this with of DNA synthesis, and these compounds go then into the heat confirmation, where again, we use biophysical and biochemical orthogonal assays to confirm the hits. If you would like to learn more about DNA encoded library screening, then I kindly invite you to check CNN webpage. Under past webinars, you can find a webinar from my colleagues, Alex Zatz, about self-service DNA encoded library screenings. I warmly recommend this webinar. At the beginning of each drug discovery campaign, we have to answer the question, which screening approach to select? And the answer is actually always the same. It depends. But this answer is, of course, not satisfying. Bottom line is the target protein and the drug discovery campaign goals steer the selection of a screening approach. If we just compare here DEL screening with fragment screening. The advantages of this screening are low protein consumption and the fact that billions of compounds can be screened in a single appendage tube. This approach is actually highly recommendable if you want to identify some tool compounds fast. And what are the limitations? Remember, each compound is tagged with the DNA sequence which is used as identification barcode. And this has to be removed from the compound before the hit confirmation. And this means we have to resynthesize it. And because DNA, attachment of the DNA tag on the compound is linked to special chemistry, at the same time, this chemistry offers limited possibilities for the building of this type of libraries. On the other hand, we have fragments. These are small molecules, less than 300 Daltons in the size. Advantages are we can target challenging targets with fragments. We efficiently sample chemical space. We can 
identify unique binding sites. And what are the limitations? Of course, we are dealing with fragments, so it's not surprisingly that these fragments have low affinity to the target. And of course, before from this fragment, we have a tool compound or the drug candidate, some substantial medicinal chemistry efforts are required. So let us now take a closer look on fragment-based drug discovery. As I mentioned, this method or this approach is especially appropriate for challenging targets. The title of this presentation is Drugging the Undruggable. What does it mean? In the past, thousands of proteins were considered undruggable. This meant that previous efforts to develop a drug against them failed. Today, the combination of novel chemical modalities and advanced technical approaches has resulted in new clinical candidates for previously undruggable targets. Which factors are defining this undruggability? First is druggable protein target. This means therapeutic effect upon its modulation. And the second, the ability of the protein to bind a small drug-like molecule. This is also called ligandability. And this is defined by the chemistry and structure of the binding site. This leads us to structure-guided drug design. And a key component of this approach is fragment screening. So let us take a closer look on the key characteristics of the challenging targets. I think that on top of your head, you will immediately say membrane proteins, RNA, DNA interacting proteins, and protein-protein interactions. Let us take a closer look on the characteristics of these challenging targets. These targets usually lack of catalytic active sites, which are, we are used when we target, for example, enzymes. Often, metal ions are present. Then we have to deal with specific lipophilicity of residuals. Very often, binding sites are featureless, lacking any deep crevices which could accommodate small molecule. And very often, there is a need for adaptive conformational changes before two proteins or protein and its binding partners interact. Especially is this prone in the field of protein-protein interactions. Protein-protein interactions are seen as one of the widest occurring biological events. They can be mainly described as weak interaction which takes place between two different protein surfaces. And they address numerous or steer numerous biological functions signaling, translocation, cell cycle re regulation, structure maintenance, etc., etc. And I think it's completely clear that they offer a broad range of interventions in different diseases. About one-third of the clinical candidates or approved drugs have been obtained by application of a fragment-based campaign. Fragment screening is especially ideally suited to target protein-protein interactions. The question, of course, is why. Fragments can bind to a small pockets available on the protein surface, and this can really assist to develop potent small drug, small molecule based drug, which then interferes with the protein protein interactions. On this list, you can find some success stories, and in the paper, cited paper from Valenti, you can find many more. I would just like to point out FDA-approved FDA venetoclax, which is an inhibitor for treatment of chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and actually revolutionized target therapy, improving the overall survival of the patients with this debilitating disease. I previously mentioned that fragment screening actually enables efficient sampling of chemical space. But what means that in detail? I would just like to remind you on the fact that fragment-based drug discovery originates from the fascinating idea to build up piece by piece a ligand for the target pocket using low molecular weight molecules as a starting bricks. 
this is similar to Lego. You know, you, you get a, a bucket or a, a box full of different pieces, and then you put them together and you see practically how everything evolves, and at the end you have practically the picture as depicted on the box. But unfortunately, with fragment-based drug discovery, we don't know how the final picture looks like. But based on this LIGO system, we can actually slowly approach to the most optimal, the most desired drug candidates. So what are the basic characteristics of a good fragment library? This library has to have optimal physical chemical properties, which are often described as the rule of three. They have molecular weight less than 300, C log P less than three, they have less than three uh, hydrogen bond acceptor or donors on, and also there are limitations on the pearlized surface area. For example, it was calculated that about 1,000 fragment covers chemical space as efficiently as one trillion diverse drug size molecules. In this image here, you can see comparison with, between Wuxi building blocks and our in how hits fragment library. And as you can see, that with much smaller amount of fragments, we really efficiently sample the chemical space. Sometimes it might be challenging also to identify novel drug-like molecules for enzymes. Here is an example of USB7, ubiquitin-specific protease, which has important role in various oncogenic pathways, and it's those attractive drug target. NMAC Discovery decided to use fragment screen to tackle these challenging targets. With the combination of fragment screen followed by structural-based drug discovery, they were able to identify a set of compounds which bind to allosteric site in this enzyme. This allosteric site was previously unknown, and it was described thanks to structural information obtained in crystallography. At this point, I would like to add that this structure was provided or resolved by Crelux. I would like to point out also some additional advantages of fragment-based drug discovery. One of them is prediction of drugability. The team from AstraZeneca analyzed their in-house data and came up with a suggestion that fragment screen is a good experimental indicator of target ligandability. What it means? It means that the outcome of fragment ligability screen gives early access to ligand information in project and can provide also an early fingerprint of the physical chemical property space, which is likely to be occupied by more lead-like compounds. Although that some researchers think that practically uh, extensive MedChem effort which is needed to optimize fragment or to let the fragment grow from a, a small 300 kilodalton molecules up to a drug-like candidate, I have to see, I have to say that actually I see this more as an advantage. Why? Because fragments provide an ability to optimize pharmacokinetics profile simultaneously with the potency as a fragment hit grows to the clinical candidate. So that means you don't need any reverse engineering of some other drug like hit before you actually discover the compound with desired physical chemical and also pharmacokinetical profile. With fragments, this can be done in the parallel. Up to now, we learned quite some advantages and also limitations of fragment-based drug discovery. Now we are getting to the point where we are saying, okay, we would like to perform a fragment screen, but which method we should use to detect this binding of the fragment to our target? As I mentioned, the problem with fragment binding is that actually it's a very weak binding, usually in micro, high micromolar range. That means that practically we need methods which are able to detect these weak bindings. And the answer, the solution is actually 
lights on the hand. We need state-of-the-art biophysical methods like SPR, X-ray crystallography, NMR, MSD, ITC, and so on. Importantly, in about two-thirds of all cases, fragment screen results also in structural biology efforts, which means that people or the scientists decide to obtain direct structural information on the binding mode of the fragment. But as I mentioned, a significant proportion, this is about 30%, will continue fragment growth and optimization without any structural information and will rely on biochemical methods to further optimize the hits. In this excellent review, Ellison and his colleagues went through all the literature on fragment screening between 2015 and 2018 and provided detailed analysis of the method used. As you can see here, in 2018, quite some targets were investigated in biochemical assays. Carefully investigating this review, one finds out that actually most of the screenings were dedicated to kinases from all other targets, especially protein-protein interactions and epigenetic treasures, for example, other state-of-the-art biophysical assays came into the place. So what actually leads to how we lead our decision which method to use for fragment screening? We have to be really aware of any limitations which it comes by the method. And so we have to use the method or the technique appropriate to the target which we want to analyze. For example, weak, frag for example, weak fragments that show no affinity in the kinase in the biochemical assay can still interact with the target, and this interaction can be confirmed by orthogonal biophysical assays. And in the case that this is unique by this site, this might be a really of great value for the further drug discovery campaign. Thus, if you get a lot of negative results in biochemical assays, it might, might be worth to revisit this target using state-of-the-art biophysical methods. As an example, the biophysical methods such as ligand and protein observed NMR or X-ray crystallography, they become more prevalent for weaker fragments where biochemical screens may be challenging. Allow me to briefly compare NMR and X-ray crystallography approach in fragment screen. Nuclear magnetic resonance NMR can be performed in two different ways. First, we can observe ligand, and in this way confirm ligand binding to unlabeled protein, or we can observe labeled, isotopically labeled protein and to monitor the changes in the protein signal upon the ligand binding. So we can screen a couple of thousands molecules uh, with this method. Advantages are that we always use unlabeled ligand and protein in every experiment, and that the protein observed NMR can deliver also structural information. But there is a main limitation to this method. NMR may require large amounts of isotopically labeled protein, and screening large libraries can be challenging. X ray crystallography, on the other hand, is a method that uses protein's crystal structure to determine the binding mode of the fragment. We can screen a few hundred molecules, and advantage is that we get really detailed information on the fragment binding mode, and this enables us fine mapping on the fragment binding site. The limitation is that we need, of course, the protein, which is willing to crystallize. It requires large quantities of homogeneous protein, and we receive no affinity information. So I just mentioned that the both methods actually require quite some protein quantities. So what are the options when we have a difficulties actually to produce enough of functional protein and this and the protein maybe does not want to crystallize? So what are other options? 
At this point, I would like to introduce you to two highly sensitive biophysical methods. One is already well known and well established, this is surface plasma resonance, and the other one is kind of new kit in town called microscale thermophoresis. So let us briefly compare both methods. As I mentioned, one is already a well-known working course and the other one is new kit in town. Surface plasma resonance, uh, as you probably know, if we need an optical biosensor that measures the interaction between immobilized molecules, uh, let's say a protein and molecules, small molecules in the solution. We can analyze a few thousand uh, molecules in this case, and advantages of SPR are well known, so it's like low protein consumption, high sensitivity, and we can very accurately measure affinity and kinetics. Limitations, also well known, is that we have to immobilize the protein to the surface of the chip, which can often cause inactivation of low stability protein. And this method is very sensitive on any solvent effect. That means the signal can be affected by solvent mismatch. Microscale thermophoresis, on the other hand, is a new kit in town, now already about 10 years on the market, but it's actually just getting into a screening, in fragment screening and screening in general. This the advantage of this technology is a site of low protein consumption and high selectivity sensitivity that we can measure the interaction in solution. The limitation, you can feel it, it requires fluorophore labeling or requires strong intrinsic fluorescence of the target. SPR and MST are next to about 10 other biophysical methods readily used at Wuxi Aptek Hits. Here I would like to introduce you microscale thermophoresis, a novel method for fragment screens. As I said, this is a new kit in town among state-of-the-art biophysical methods which can be used to detect uh, binding of fragments to the target. You can find now already several publications out there using this method. So what is the basic principle of this technique? In this technique, a variation in the fluorescence signal is detected, which is a result of temperature gradient induced by infrared laser, as shown on the picture B. The extent of variation in this fluorescence signal correlates with the binding of a ligand to fluorescence target. And this is depicted on the picture C. And of course, now we get back to the point, fluorescence labeling of the protein. Similarly, as immobilization of the protein to the surface, also in SPR, also the labeling using classical NHS or malemid chemistry can have some significant effect on the protein. Thus, the influence of the labeling on the protein has to be investigated or determined upfront. But to avoid this type of significant uh, influence of the dye or the labeling on the screening, Nanotempo developed special site-specific labeling. This labeling relies on the presence of HISTEC, which is otherwise very often used in the protein production process. This HISTEC is readily recognized by the dye, which is called red tris nta This combination enables very gentle site-specific labeling of the protein without any danger to compromise the tertiary structure of the protein. So this type of the labeling is highly recommended to be used in MST. To demonstrate to you the utilization of MST in fragment screen, we decided to tackle STING. STING plays an important role in innate immunity. It induces type 1 interferon production when cells are infected by intracellular pathogens. It's important target in inflammation, infection, and cancer, and thus either antagonists or agonists of this protein are of interest. Very lo a long time, sting was perceived as a challenging and almost undruggable target. Because 
of the ease of use of MST and also of this very gentle labeling using Retris NDA, we decided to use this option to tackle stink in fragment screening. We started with assay development. As I mentioned, we used the Retris NDA to label stink over his tags and used positive control to 3C GMP, which actually bound to our label stink with high affinity comparable to the literature data, and thus the assay was validated. In the next step, we continued with the primary screening at a single concentration, about five uh, single concentration of 500 micromolar and a duplicate. And what you can see here, everything but deviates from this reddish straight line, this were hits. These are summarized in this pie chart. We had about 7.8% of hits. Uh, we had some potential binders, and we have very less fragments that would cause either aggregation or they would interfere in SA with SA in any other way. While performing primary fragment screen, we continued with the optimization of two additional orthogonal assays. This is SPR and nano-DSF. SPR is well known, and you know it's immobilization. We immobilize things on the chip surface and in use the same positive control as for MST, and the data were undistinguishable. On the other side, we use nano-DSF um, as a control or for the hit validation. Nano-DSF is a novel method which uses intrinsic fluorescence of the tryptophan to monitor the changes in the folding upon heating of the protein. Tryptophan is a solvatochrome. That means it's fluorescence and fluorescence intensity, they change upon the environment in which tryptophan is. That means that when practically, when the tryptophan is buried in the protein, the fluorescence, its fluorescence will be at about 320 nanometers. And when we heat the protein, the protein gets denaturated and the tryptophan we are then exposed to the liquid, um, to the aqueous environment, the fluorescence will change to 350 nanometers. And with this method, we can observe this protein unfolding using practically no other dye. And this is actually really of great advantage when you are dealing with fragments, so you don't have to worry about potential interference of the dye with the entire assay setup. And when the molecule, either that small molecule or the fragment binds to the protein, it causes significant terminal shift, uh, increase in the melting temperature, and this is the same phenomena which we are used to otherwise to observe in classical DSF. And here, just think study in numbers, we analyzed 260 fragments, in three orthogonal assays, we identified 66 binders, and their affinity was between 10 and 500 micromoles. In this slide, I briefly summarize typical fragment-based drug discovery workflow. We followed also this workflow during our case study. We started with fragment screen, continued with heat confirmation, then orthogonal heat validation and structure generation. If the time is the question, then we always recommend to start structure generation in the parallel with fragment screen. So now you may ask, so what, what, what kind of sense does it make to start structure generation before I have my fragment hit list? Yeah, the answer is quite simple. In fragment screening, we usually have, get many hits. As you heard before, for our Stink project, we got 66 hits. So in most of the time, clients would prefer to go with entire 66 fragments into structure generation. Thus, the easiest way to obtain this structure information is actually to have uh, crystals of the APO protein already ready and then to soak the fragments and to generate the structure. So let's say we decided to uh, go for or to continue with X-ray crystallography follow-up of fragment screen, and we have already apocrystals. We soak them with fragments, and we obtain 
some uh, confirmed structures and binding poses of fragments to the target, and thus we can continue structure-led fragment-to-lead development. But sometimes it happens that we are not able to obtain any structure, either with X-ray crystallography or NMR. That still, by far, does not mean that your fragment-based drug discovery campaign is now over. About 30% of all fragment-based drug discovery campaign actually continue successfully without any structure information. This screening campaigns or further optimization of fragment growth it actually relies on the activity-led fragment-to-lead development. As I mentioned, about 30% of all campaigns they successfully go this path. Because the structural information is of large advantage during the hit to lead development, we decided to integrate structural biology as a main component of the target to hit platform. Next to X-ray crystallography and NMR, we offer also cryo-EM. So let's just take a look how we actually tackle the structural biology-based part of our case studies. As I mentioned, we identified 66 fragments, and these 66 fragments are currently analyzed by X-ray crystallography using crystal soaking approach. So how does that work? First, we have to establish soaking system. This is done by using apoprotein, that means the protein without any ligand bind, and as you can see here, for Sting, we were able to obtain nice crystals, resolve the structure where it's seen that there is no ligand bind. Then we go in the fragment soaking. Of course, one of the fragments or molecules is also a positive control. Then it goes to automated data processing. We can continue with manual refinement of chosen hits. And then we have structures on our hand, which can then lead us for further fragment to hit series development. Importantly to know is that the soaking of crystals implies a given protein conformation that might be observed active or inactive, but could also hinder some fragments from binding. My colleagues from um, crystallography, they told me that sometimes they can even observe how these crystals actually dissolve because the ligand or fragment that binds uh, can actually destabilize the crystals. But now you would say, oh, this is disaster. Not really. This is actually a confirmation that your ligand of interest or a fragment of interest really interacts with the protein. And now our colleagues at crystallography, they can use this ligand to co-crystallize it together with the protein and obtain the structure in this way. During my presentation, I mentioned that various biophysical methods can be used for fragment screen. One of them was also X-ray crystallography. This can be used as standalone option too. Uh, so how that actually differs for, uh, from the approach which I just described for our case study? Very less. In both cases, we first have to produce high-quality crystal-grade protein, and we have to establish soaking system. That means we have to obtain crystals of the apoprotein. Um, we have to make sure that these crystals are not too sensitive on the DMSO, and then we can continue with fragment soaking. In the meanwhile, we can think about the library selection. There are always different options available. Upon automated data processing, then if you are lucky, we have some hits available, which we can manually refine. And then again, we have excellent start point for structure lead fragment to hit series development. I hope that I managed to convince you that fragment based drug discovery is really a good starting point from, to address many different questions and also to address challenging targets. At the Wuxi Aptek Hits platform, we provide a one-stop solution for clients seeking support in this matter. We start by providing high-quality protein. We continue with hit finding 
either is that a fragment screen or DNA encoded library screen and hit confirmation. As I stressed a few times during the presentation, high quality protein is essential for successful screenings um, downstream biophysical validation and structural biology. I think that I showed several cases to prove that fragment-based drug discovery is suitable for challenging targets. It allows efficient sampling of chemical space and identification of unique binding sites. There are several biophysical approaches available to tackle fragment screenings and microscale tomophoresis technology was presented as innovative approach for fragment screen. To prove, as a proof of concept, MSC-based fragment screening with a sting case study was presented. And at the end, I would like to point out that Wuxi Aptek Hits platform supports structure-led or activity-led fragment-to-lead development. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I'm open for questions. All right, um, thank you, Nushka, and um, we will move on now to the Q&A portion of the presentation. Our first question, uh, what is the dynamic range of MSC? Well, um, the, uh, one of the great advantages of MSC is actually a giant dynamic range, which actually ranges from one picomolar up to millimolar range. Can other purification tags, for example, biotin, be used to fluorescently label proteins for MSC? And uh, can MABs work, for example, anti-flag or GSP, or do the, they come apart in the IRB? <clears throat> um, you, during, practically, when we test the different approaches in labeling of MSC, we find out that practically small tech, like his tech, is the most optimal approach because then we can use really tiny dye or tiny dye complex that binds to uh, this region. When one uses, uh, let's say, fluorescently labeled antibodies which recognize special tech, then the changes of this binding complex upon the binding of a ligand is too small, and then the signal-to-noise ratio in MSC uh, goes down. So this is actually um, because of that reason we don't really then recommend to use, uh, let's say, antibodies or nanobodies for the labeling in MSC. Are there any problems with fluorescence quenching? <clears throat> Sometimes, uh, I would say occasionally, uh, honestly, I have to say it's rarely, uh, we observe uh, fluorescence quenching. Uh, it can happen, and it actually can have uh, two different reasons. For reasons, first reason is that the ligand binds close to the side where the fluor fluorophore is attached to the protein, and actually it quenches due to binding of the protein, uh, of the ligand to the protein. Or, on the other hand, this uh, fluorescence quenching can be unspecific and it actually results from direct interaction between, let's say, fragment or some small molecule with the dye. But, of course, we established a process how we uh, differ between, let's say, specific fluorescence quenching or unspecific. But, in general, fluorescence quenching represents no problem in MSD. Which SPR instrument did you use for the sting fragment screening? Um, for this screening, we used the Biocore 8K instrument. And uh, how many fragments were screened? Uh, we screened uh, for the sting, we screened 2,600 fragments. What is the correlation of MSC and other method, methods? So, um, depending on the target, the correlation can be very high or limited. But I would like to, to point out that actually whenever you compare different methods, you see that actually 
only some part of the hits they actually uh, overlap. But what we regularly actually observe that depending on the method used, you, ca you get additional hits depending on the method. So for example, this is also a case uh, for the MSC, where in MSC we actually see some additional hits compared to SBR. Can fragment screening be used to identify protein-protein stabilizers? Uh, so far, uh, not yet. And uh, how sensitive is the MSP prone to false positive, um, such as co that caused by a compound aggregation, pH change, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a great question. Um, actually, this is uh, one of the advantages of MSD that this measurement actually happens in solution. That means if the compound aggregates and causes uh, also protein aggregation, we see that immediately in MSD traces and practically this fragment or compound is then flagged as a potential aggregator. And then of course we can follow up uh, these stories. And of course, uh, we always uh, pay attention and make sure that the titration of the compound or the fragment to the buffer does not cause this pH gradient, which is, could be actually a problem also in any other method. Why start with MSP when that is a lower throughput than DSF, which can be done in a 96 well plate? Um, DSF on, uh, is usually less sensitive um, because of that reason we prefer biophysical methods which yield also then PD and in the MSD actually it's now we, we have an, uh, um, an instrument it's called Diantus where the measurement takes place in 364 well played. So practically now MSD has a very high throughput. How many diverse biophysical assays would be sufficient for narrowing the number of hits and their validation? And how do you choose which ones to apply? Mm. So um, this is also a very good question. Um, thanks. Um, Usually, I mean, I actually, I, I, uh, I, I was, uh, I followed the statistics. So, uh, in the past, uh, like two orthogonal methods were, were used to um, confirm fragments. Nowadays, these uh, are close to four different methods, and how we choose them. This is actually really very target specific. Yeah, so, it's the honest question. If you have a DEL and FBDD platform in your hand, how do you decide um, to use which platform for selection once you have a specific target? Um, we always work closely together with the client to find out what are his needs, what are the goals of the um, drug discovery campaign, and also depending on the target, then we can move in one or another direction. Um, next question, I may have missed it, but what is the protein and fragment concentrations in MSC? Um, in MSC, practically in our case study, and this is also the concentration with, with, uh, which is most often used in MSC, is actually 20 nanomolars of labeled proteins. Uh, sometimes this varies between 5 to 50 nanomolar, but we always keep the concentration of the labeled protein well below the expected KD. And this is, of course, in fragments, uh, not uh, it's <laughs> easy to achieve. Uh, for fragments, we actually we start the first screening at 500 micromolars. What is the advantage of FBDD over screening for bigger compounds? Um, so um, as I mentioned, I mean, 
At the beginning, we start with a much smaller library, smaller fragments, um, and of course, upon the hit list, we, we, we have uh, very open possibilities how we continue that practically with, with, with uh, chemical optimization. Fragment screening is often used for challenging targets and also very often when other screening methods actually did not work so well or not at all. So um, this type of uh, so say challenging targets previously failed uh, screening campaigns, this is kind of the recipe for, for, for uh, fragment screening. Did I hear that you use DMSO as a solvent during screening? Have you considered other solvents? Uh, DMSO is actually our preferred solvent for the screening. Uh, during the opti assay optimization and uh, assay development, we closely monitor how DMSO influences also protein stability. So that we are really fine-tuning then the DMSO um, concentration or finite DMSO concentration. Um, so far, actually, we, it was not really a need uh, to to test any other solvents. I know that some people like to to use methanol or ethanol, but this because they are quite volatile. This can influence then, the, um, um, so to say, the concentration which is actually applied, and then this might be um, not so precise. So the, because of that reason, the MSO is our preferred solvent. Does PFA salt have any effect on the MSP method? Uh, excuse me, can you please repeat the question? Uh, does PFA salt have any effect on the MSP method? Um, so uh, let me put this way. The, the advantage of, of the MST is this is highly flexible and, and uh, highly robust uh, on, on, on uh, different, different uh, additive uh, salts. And if we have, if we deal with something which is a little bit, let's say, more exotic or unusual, then we always uh, make a control experiment. Does MST work well with protac development? Um, yes, it does. <laughs> we have in-house data which demonstrate that it can be really well used uh, uh, to characterize this type of hits. So, uh, for example, we are all aware that um, SPR can be tricky when one is analyzing uh, complexes or formation of complexes or maybe, let's say, dissociation of complexes. But in MST, we can design experiments very carefully and we have really very good uh, the success rate in efficiently establishing assays also for PROTEC. All right, um, uh, the next question is a two-parter. First, uh, what is the principle of, of the Wuxi Fragment lib uh, Library? Is it structural variety or synthetic accessibility? Um, according to the information which I uh, received from our experiments, they actually try to balance out both. So it's a, it's a, a mixture of, um, it's a compromise or a mixture between, or, or the best of both words, so to say, uh, structural diversity and chemical accessibility. Right. And the second part uh, is the Wuxi fragment library composed of commercially available compounds or synthetic compounds. Yes, uh, all all fragments which are in our library fragment library are commercially available. What is your opinion of non-functional binders? That is, compounds that only bind uh, but do affect function, especially in fragment screening. <laughs> uh, oh yes, <laughs> I, I have to. I have to smile. This is. Uh, this is. Uh, also something, sometimes this can be very interesting in the point of view of allosteric modulation because, I mean, the proteins are 
allosteric machines, and sometimes the fragment can bind, but still does not, um, so to say, uh, does not have any influence of the protein function. But remember, this is a legal building block pr principle. So if you grow your fragment, then uh, you can uh, practically end up with really good uh, modulator of the protein function. Is there a technique that can be used to screen fragment targeting protein-protein uh, interaction? Um, as I as I mentioned, uh, with MSD we can actually access uh, this, or we can address these types of questions very well. How do you choose targeted proteins or receptors for docking? For docking, hmm. so uh, <laughs> um, this is a tricky question because I mean we are we are now um, for docking. Of course, we need structural structural information. So I mean uh, um, within Wuxi AppTech, we have also a virtual huge virtual screening libraries available. And of course, the, the basis for this docking um, um, experiment, so to say, is the, um, is the existence of the structure, which can be used for the docking, or we can actually uh, perform uh, homology modeling and then dock practically on the, the best possible homology model. On the other hand, if there are, if there's Something known about um, the the compound. I mean, this is not docking, but then one can do, for example, pharmacophore screening or something like that. But it's more computation. Everything. What are the time frames for each step of the process? The time frames. Uh, so usually uh, in fragment screening. Um, we are quite fast on the way, so to say, depending on the target, we need uh, a week or so to, to develop the assay. And depending on the method used, uh, use, we need then uh, one to two weeks for a uh, single dose screening, and then uh, a week or two for practically first round of um, hit uh, validation. So that means uh, if everything works smoothly, uh, you are in less than one month. Uh, with the, you have a, a list of hits in about one month. And then, of course, uh, the process continues with the orthogonal uh, methods, depending on what you choose. But this can be also done in a week or two. And then structural biology. Um, yeah, because of that reason, we actually, uh, if you decide for, for example, uh, X-ray crystallography, uh, we start that in parallel, and we need then also, let's say, eight to twelve weeks to to get things up and running. Could ITC be used in a fragment screen? Um, ITC is actually used now and then in a uh, in fragment screen. And the main problem of ITC is actually low throughput and very high consumption of the protein. But it can be used. In your presentation, you showed SEC, NanoDSF, and MSP as characterization methods to test protein quality. Since protein quality is so critical, what if there is no commercially available tool, tool compound? How would you assess the protein quality then? Yeah, <laughs> yeah this, is, this is kind of a situation that uh, happens very often because we are getting more and more interesting targets on our bench. Um, usually, at least, let's say, a, a bind protein binding partner is known. So sometimes then we decide practically to perform binding assay with the binding partner and not with a small molecule. This is one option. Second, uh, um, but what we always see is actually if uh, nano DSF, which is actually 
shows the uh, thermal stability of the protein and shows very nice transition. This is actually already a uh, good guarantee that the protein is properly folded. And if uh, the client is not satisfied, let's say, with these options, or our scientists are not satisfied with these options, then we explore also other methods like uh, uh, CD or something like that to, to see that the protein is really properly folded. All right, um, that's all the time that we have. Thank you again, Nushka, for your fascinating presentation. And thank you to our participants for being a great audience. Um, be sure to check CNEN or CNEN online for information on the next edition of CNEN webinars. Thank you to On24 for technology and production services. And thank you, Wuxi AppTech, for sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. For CNEN webinars, I'm Alexandra Taylor. Goodbye.